Welcome everybody to another Winged Wednesday webinar and especially to those who are new joining us this week. Today we're going to be talking about bats and COVID-19 which is obviously very topical and important issue for, for a lot of us working on bat conservation and research. So our panel this week are Vanda, Kirsty and Ricardo. Vanda Marcotta is a professor at the University of Pretoria She's the director of, for the Center of Viral Zoonoses and based in South Africa. She also is occupying the South African Research Chair, which is funded by the South African government through the Department of Science and Innovation. Her research focuses on viral pathogens in African bats, and she follows a multidisciplinary approach. Next, we welcome Kirsty Park, who's the chair of Bats Without Borders, we are delighted to say, and she's also a trustee for the UK-based Bat Conservation Trust. Kirsty is a professor of conservation science at the University of Stirling, based in Scotland, and her research focuses on the effects of anthropogenic change on biodiversity and developing solutions to mitigate the impacts of humans on wildlife. We're also welcoming Ricardo Rocha, who is based at CBU in Bio in Portugal. He is a postdoctoral fellow at the Centre for Biological and Genetic Resources. He has an interdisciplinary research at the interface of conservation science and ecology. He is a trained tropical ecologist and has worked extensively um, doing his, his PhD in central Brazilian Amazon. Um, but he's also worked in Madagascar and Kenya and is currently focused on ecosystem services provided by bats in Madeira Island. Ricardo has also recently published uh, a, a key paper in biological conservation, working with a psychologist in how to actually key messages we should get across when talking about bats and COVID. We'll be putting a link at that bit um, in, in the description below of this video, so please link to that to find out more about the paper, as well as a short video um, that Kirsty was involved with that she has also presented about that and COVID. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Vanda to start her presentation. Thank you very much, Vanda. So I'm really just going to be quick because I think it's important that we have more discussion than listening to me talking the whole afternoon. And I really want to thank Rachel for this opportunity and putting together this panel who consists of quite a diverse group of people and also just for this initiative. Um, it's important that we talk about these type of things in a group where there's lots of different people with different disciplines and different expertise and that we can really understand what's going on with zoonotic diseases and specifically with COVID-19. So I'm just going to share a few things that set the stage for the discussions and what we know and what we don't know and some of my thoughts. So, uh, let me just see. No, it doesn't want to, oh, there we go. Oh, no, it goes too quick. Okay, so just, we know with COVID-19, we're talking about a coronavirus and coronaviruses are very diverse. There's hundreds of them and if you, test somebody, a person or an animal, you will probably find a coronavirus. And we divide them into these four genus, genera, which is the alpha, the beta, the gamma and the delta, where two of them are not associated with bats, specifically the gamma and the delta ones. And then the alpha ones, there's um, some association with bats, but also lots of other hosts. And then the beta coronaviruses are the ones that is relevant to today's talk. You can see there's lots of different hosts, including humans, bats, rodents, camels, cows. Um, so it's really a very diverse group. What we also need to understand is that this is a, a RNA virus and this has got certain implications. Um, the virus can mutate quite a lot during its replication cycle, which means if those mutations um, are in certain regions of the virus genome, it can make it enables them to spill over into other animals. This happens during every replication cycle and depending on where these mutations are, they've got a certain effect. What coronaviruses can also do that other viruses don't all do 
is um, that they can recombine. So they can, if you've got an infection of two coronaviruses, they can uh, exchange parts of their genome. And that obviously lead to quite a dramatic change. So this is also something we need to realize. And then if you look at the little picture of the virus, you will see there's these little things on the outside and that is called the spike proteins. And this is quite important with coronaviruses. So these spike proteins can bind to a specific receptor and they're very specific. It's like a puzzle. That spike protein needs to fit the receptor on a host cell. So if these spike proteins are very different, for instance, in a bat virus, it's not just going to jump over to humans and infect it. There needs to be similarity. So a lot of times you look at some of the pieces inside the virus, like the polymerized genes, and they will be very conserved, but the spike proteins are actually very different. So then there's certain implications for spillover. So just a few things to, to look at. What we also need to understand with coronaviruses are that in bats, they seem to have a gastrointestinal tropism, which means typically that we get it in fecal samples. But in humans, it's then a respiratory disease and we see it typically in droplet transmission. So there's a difference between the, the two and that is also the route of transmission um, that we think um, it's used for coronaviruses to spill over. So this is a, a complicated slide. I don't like showing phylogenetic trees, but I just wanna show a few things here. So the ICTV decide how we classify viruses and we can't just use a little piece of a genome and this is what is up here at the top. We need to use several parts of the coronavirus genome to decide how closely related viruses are. And if we don't have the full genome, which is first price, we can go for all these different regions and put them together and see how different the viruses are. So if we just look at this top um, figure B, that is all the SARS viruses, or SARS and SARS-related viruses. There's SARS coronavirus that spilled over in 2002. Here's SARS coronavirus 2 that's currently causing the COVID-19 outbreak. And then there's all kinds of other viruses in between that's from bats or from other animals that we call SARS-related. So everything in this group, people will refer to as related, or sometimes they use the word like. So they're not all the same. You can see these branches are a bit different. Some of them are more closely related than others, but that's what we mean if we use that terminology. And then if we think about the history, and I think it's important to look at the history. If you look at this on the right-hand side, um, the diagram, there's lots of viruses associated with bats that we know have spilled over to humans. And all the orange arrows this is mild cold symptoms. You won't probably even know you've got it. You won't even go to a lab to test yourself. It will just feel like the normal cold. But then we had these two serious outbreaks in the past, SARS coronavirus in 2002, and then MERS, that is still a bit ongoing in the Arabian Peninsula. And then SARS coronavirus 2 or COVID-19 as we know it now. So just to look at the history and because the history actually dictates how we interpret some of the things that that's in the literature now. And that's why I think it's, it's important to just look at this. So SARS coronavirus emerged in 2003, also in China in a different region from um, SARS coronavirus 2. It caused about 10% fatalities. It went on for a little while and then it was completely contained and there has not been new cases was also a new virus in the human population. MERS is still ongoing, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on MERS, but um, this virus is now, the reservoir host is camels. Although there's been a link with bats, bats doesn't seem to play any role in the epidemiology of this virus currently. And SARS coronavirus 2 is the one that's now really causing havoc all over the world with almost 8 million cases and over 400,000 deaths, and we know how devastating it has been for several countries to deal with this outbreak. What did we know about SARS coronavirus that emerged in 2002? Um, so this was again a new virus in, in humans. We didn't see it before, so we didn't know where it came from. There was again a link to the wet market. And here they were able to test the palm civets and the raccoon dogs positive for the virus SARS coronavirus that was also in humans. 
However, we first thought it was the raccoon dogs and the palm civets, that is um, the reservoirs. But when I started looking at wild farmed animals and animals um, that came from, um, of wild animals and animals that came from farmed environments, they didn't have the virus. So these animals came into the market without the infection. They got it somewhere in the market, like the humans did. They were not the ones that's the reservoir. And that is when all of this craziness started to look for where does this virus come from? It's a new virus. And when I started testing wildlife, bats came up positive with related viruses. And it's important related. So at that point, which was around 2005, um, these viruses that we detected in bats in China were very different from the human outbreak viruses. Um, especially, I've told you about the spike protein. It was only 60% similar on the spike protein. It was not able to recognize receptors on human cells, so there was no indication that these viruses could spill over directly from bats to humans. There may be some intermediate hosts, which wasn't sure, and this went on for, for quite a few years. We would find SARS-related viruses in bats all over the world, not just in China, but they were all very, very different, although they belonged to that same clade that I showed you at the beginning that we call related or like viruses. So then in um, 11 years after the SARS outbreak, there was a paper published which identified a SARS-like virus still because it's not sars corona which was 95% um, similar. And what was important about this finding was also that this virus could recognize the ACE2 receptor, which is on human cells. So for the first time, there was evidence that this virus that we identified in a bat in China actually has the capability to infect human cells directly. It's still not the direct progenitor of that outbreak in 2002, but it's a more closely related virus that may have the potential to spill over directly to humans or also to other intermediate hosts that have the same receptor on their cells. So that's where we were with SARS coronavirus 1, and that's still where we are with SARS coronavirus 1. So now we're in a new outbreak with a virus that we now call SARS coronavirus 2, that's causing the outbreak um, COVID 19, the disease. And a lot of things are very similar. So again, this, there was a link to the Wuhan seafood market. This is a different part of China from the previous outbreaks. Now, there's a lot of question marks and there's a lot of questions still arising around the link with the Wuhan market. So initially, the, re the reason why this market was implicated was because when they identified the, the cluster of pneumonia patients, some of them had a link to the market. But the more people started looking into the detail, it was also clear that there was people in that cluster that didn't have contact with each other and also did not have contact with the market. So that already is a question mark. Where do those people get the disease? They did some environmental sampling from this market um, where 33 out of 585 were positive, but this data is still very sketchy. What samples were positive? The sequences are not out. Um, the market has been completely shut down, so there was no um, option for follow-up studies. Um, the market's not there anymore to go and follow up, follow up. The animals are not there. So that makes it very difficult. And it seems like none of the positive samples, some of the information coming out in the general press, that none of these positive samples were from animals. So that immediately puts a question mark on that. Was bats present in the market from the reports um, that um, came out in the literature? Bats was not present in this specific market. Um, so was the market not just an incidental part of the outbreak where people contracted the disease either from each other or from a completely uh, a different animal source? And then an important thing that, that makes it very difficult to ever understand where this virus originated, um, or the fact that we're not sure who patient zero was. Was this first cluster actually the start of the outbreak, or were there cases before this? Because it's important to know where did it start to actually look at the origin of where the spillover may 
have happened. So these questions will stay with us probably because we don't have the market, we don't have this information to go back to at this point to understand. So what do we have? From the history, we know that SARS viruses, SARS-like viruses or related viruses are linked to bats. So obviously people started looking at that link again, where did it come from? And when they started going back to some of the data that were already available in labs, it wasn't published at that point, they found viruses that were similar if you look at the nuclear assets compared to SARS coronavirus 2. So it will group in that same general group of viruses. The first ones were not that similar, but then they identified this um, RTA um, virus that is actually more than 95% similar. And what is again important with this virus is that it can recognize the ACE2 receptors that is present on human cells, but also on other animal cells like your ferrets, your cats, um, uh, your pigs. So theoretically, when they tested it in the lab, it could infect any one of those animals and also humans. So that's what we know. There was also the story with, with the pangolin. Um, so we, this is the bat virus, and then there was the pangolin. Pangolins that tested positive for a similar virus. If we look at how distant the viruses are, SARS coronavirus to in humans is more related to the bat virus than to the pangolin virus. Although if you start looking at the receptor binding domains, there's also a lot of similarity with the pangolin virus, but fancy phylogenetic analysis that some people are doing, um, they say that the chance is larger that it's the bat virus that probably spilled over somewhere than the pangolin virus. And it can even be that the pangolin is just, it got the infection from somewhere else and it's a dead end infection. It's not even serving as an intermediate host. So that's all we have. This is the data we have. Um, from previous studies, and this is the only link we can currently say have a potential to be true for where COVID-19 disease came from. So lots of question marks. So we know there's a related virus in bats. We know there's a related virus in pangolin. We now know that this related virus in bats can theoretically spill over directly without an intermediate dose because it can recognize the receptors. But it's not the same virus that caused the outbreak. It's still a related virus. It's not the exact same virus. We also know that um, other intermediate hosts may play a role. Um, we know the virus can infect cats, like I said, um, pigs and some other animals. And we now know we're sitting with a human outbreak where the virus spread quite efficiently from human to human. So there's a few things we know and there's a few things that we don't know. And I just want to go to this last slide and end off with this. So the reality is we know that there's a lot of coronaviruses in bats. I mean, if we take a fecal sample from a bat anywhere in the world, you will find some diversity of coronaviruses in there. It's a virus that, um, so this is nuclear acids that I'm talking about, not live virus. And we know that there's this high diversity circulating in bats. We also know that some of this diversity are related to some of our known human coronaviruses. For instance, SARS coronavirus in 2002, there's some relation to and also SARS coronavirus 2. And we also know that some of these viruses can, can spill over directly based on looking at their genomes and what receptors they can use for recognition. So they can have the potential to jump directly from a bat to a human. We don't have evidence of that yet, and, but we know they can theoretically do that. So we need to deal with this reality that we have this diversity of coronaviruses in bats. That we can't ignore. It's published, it's in the scientific literature. Um, we know the potential is there that they can potentially spill over. But where I think the important missing things are is zoonotic diseases don't spill over everywhere. Otherwise, we would have a zoonotic outbreak every day. There's reasons why it happens. And we've been so focused on the diversity that we're finding in animals that we're not really looking at the factors that leads to spillover. And, and most of the time, it's human behavior. Um, we farming animals or mixing animals or 
urbanization or going into forest areas. There's so many reasons why it can happen and it can be so different for different regions that we need to really understand that instead of just looking at the diversity and making conclusions and not being able to answer what's happening here to get it to humans in the end. So there needs to be opportunity for spillover. Otherwise, these viruses will just happily live in bats. They don't make the bats sick. <laughs> the bats have, have learned to live with these viruses and um, control their replication. If we don't have this interaction, the viruses will not spill over in the end. So I think that's some of the thoughts that I wanted to share, and then I'll open the floor for questions and discussion. Thank you very much, Vanda. Um, so we have a question um, from Lance, who says, um, how does the coronavirus affect animals? Um, okay, so it depends. Some animals can become sick, but it, it depends completely on the coronavirus. So there's, there's um, dark coronaviruses that can give them flu. So it's typically the same respiratory disease that you will see in humans with most of the animals. But if it's a reservoir species, like we're talking about with bats, then there's absolutely no, no disease, signs of disease that you will see in that animal. That makes it a true reservoir. So you won't see any signs of disease. And bats are considered a, a true reservoir of coronaviruses. So they don't show any, any signs of disease. We also have a question from Mohammed, who's saying he is working on bats in Pakistan and he has some samples preserved um, uh, for coronavirus detection uh, from Pakistan if there's opportunities to collaborate. I think, yes, it, it's always important to know, you know, what's going on in your specific region and he's welcome to contact me or I can also put him into contact with people that's actually working in Pakistan. It's a bit difficult getting samples from Pakistan to South Africa, but there may be some that's closer that, can, that you, can, you can be um, collaborating with. So please contact me and then I'll help you with that. Uh, yes, yeah. I will contact you. Uh, <laughs> actually, I am a PhD scholar here in Pakistan, University of Veterinary and Animal Sciences. Uh, we have just uh, uh, studied genetic diversity in bats, and those samples I have preserved in our labs. Yeah, so I try to contact you. Okay. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. And um, so we've got a question um, from Rina who wants to know. Um, what is known about the transmission of coronaviruses from humans to bats? So I can also, maybe some of the other panel men members can also contact, um, can also comment on that, sorry. Um, so I don't think we know. So theoretically, I mean, if the virus can go from a bat to humans, the virus can also go from humans to bats. Um, it's the same receptor that's involved then. So it is a risk if we go with the flu and we go and sample bats and we breathe on them and we have close contact with them. But I don't think we really know. There's no scientific evidence to show that. But I think we make a lot of conclusions about how COVID came into the human population. We can also make that conclusion um, on how people call it reverse zoonotic zoonosis happens and how the virus can move back into the animal population. Because if you look at the virus, it is possible. Thank you. I don't know if, if Kirsty or uh, Ricardo would like to add anything, or we can... No, I don't, I don't have any other information to add. I, I think Rhonda's right. We, we don't really know. Um, theoretically, it's possible, but we don't have any evidence that, um, that that's happening at the moment. I guess we do, in which case, I guess we need to take precautions um, to try and prevent humans from possibly um, infecting bats that they might be catching for, say, research purposes. So it's about taking the necessary precautions. Thank you. And the only thing that I can, I can only echo Chrissy's words that, uh, yeah, we, we kind of need to act as if we had the virus at the moment. 
uh, and if we don't need to handle them, we, we, we shouldn't be doing so, uh, just until we have a better understanding of disease transmission and so on and so forth. And that has been the, the, the guidelines that have been put forward was to try to use protective gear to, and to try to avoid contact as much as possible for the time being, just in case. And that is true for bats, but I would say that it's true for a range of other wildlife that might be in succession, but might be sensitive to the, to the virus as well. Thank you. Um, I need to add to that because I see the second part was because they've got a captive colony. So I think the same rules will apply if you work with animals than your contact with humans. If you during this outbreak and even just during normal flu season, um, if you're sick, you're not gonna go and work with animals. So there needs to be some type of, of controls in place where you screen people for temperature and you do the symptom screening like you would for humans having human contact also when you work with animals. Thank you. So we have another question um, saying, do you think that by denying an association between bats and COVID-19, one indirectly contributes to the mistrust of the scientific community and the empowerment? So I think, uh, Ricardo, do you want to maybe start with that one? Yes, I just need to, well, this, this relates directly with the, with the paper and why I felt the need of uh, writing the paper for biological conservation. And so I think that we're navigating very complex waters here when we speak about uh, bats and zoonosis or wildlife and zoonosis in, in general. And, and many times we speak more with the heart than with the, with, with the reason, with being true to facts. And by at any point we can be untrue to facts, facts or present only a partial view. Um, we need to, to, to understand the uh, psychological drivers of behavior and try to frame the message in a way that we don't uh, vilify bats or present them as, as, the, as the bad actors um, in, in either this outbreak or others. But nonetheless, like we, we cannot discredit science as a whole. Because I, I do think that if, if we engage in a, in, a, in a space in which we're undermining what other scientists are, are putting forward based on the best science available, we might be undermining our stems as well. And we're undermining science as a whole. So that, that was one of my big worries for this paper. Just trying to, yeah, we need to, to speak the truth about bats, what they have that is uh, beneficial for humans. But if there's any aspect that is not so positive, we cannot uh, undermine the, the truth uh, around it. Thank you. And we have we've got another question um, that um, says a preprint published online by Lynn and Chen early in June called into question the findings that and the paper said that um, that RATG13 is 96% similar to COVID-19 virus. Has anyone seen this or has there been any other follow-up from it? Uh, so, so I'm just a bit unsure about the question. So um, are they questioning that it is 96% similar or, it, it or called, are they agreeing with that? It's uh, called into question the findings that the paper um, said that it was 96% similar. I'll just, I've got it in a private chat. I'll just um, put it in. Uh, okay, the I think there's, there's quite a few peer-reviewed papers out that, that have looked at um, the genetics of this, this closely related bat virus. So I think they've even looked at specific domains and even broke it down to um, the spike protein binding regions. So I think there's, there's good evidence to show that there's, there's quite a high relatedness, but we need to understand what 96% mean. Um, I think it's also in your, your statement on, on COVID-19 that we're looking at about a 40 to 70 year time that this virus had to evolve somewhere. So it's, it's still quite different, um, although we're talking about a 96% similarity over the whole genome. So 
So, um, Rachel, I don't know if I can jump in with some with some yeah. questions. Of course, you can. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. So I was wondering, Vanda. Uh, so, so now there's evidence that bats can contract this virus, uh, and we we do know that bats are active predators of cats, especially in urban settings and so on and so uh, and so forth. So. How big do you think there is the possibility of uh, bats, uh, cats playing a big role in this sort of dynamic as intermediates of this disease? So I couldn't hear the last part of the question, Ricardo. No, ah, sorry. No, I'm just saying that we, we know that cats can get infected with this specific coronavirus. Um, and not speaking about only about COVID-19, but speaking about other zoonoses, how big of a role do you think that cats being active predators of bats and being in very close contact with humans can play in this sort of outbreak? So it's a difficult question, but just my logic, and this, this is not based on scientific data, we haven't seen cats spreading COVID um, playing a real role in this outbreak. And I mean, humans also have close contact with, with cats. So I think it, it's not something that we should be too worried about unless we get good scientific data out. But it will probably, it, it's more a case of humans giving cats the virus and it may not even spread very far after that. And also, uh, another question that is not related, but we always speak about uh, bats and coronavirus. Uh, and we use uh, bats as a, as a unit, as if they were all the same, where in fact we know that there's uh, over uh, 1,400 species of bats that are very distinct in, uh, and to each other. How can we change the narrative so that we speak about bats and zoonosis but we specify given, given bats so that we don't vilify them all in one go as we have been doing up until now. So this would be more a general question to anyone. Anyway. I think that's, it's an important question because um, I think somebody also asked on the chat if there's other families than the rhinolophus or the horseshoe bats that we found um, SARS viruses in, but no. So these viruses sometimes have a very, very specific ecological niche. It can even be species specific and not even genus specific. But that goes back to general education about bats, you know, telling the public more about the species and how different they are and showing them and showing them the characteristics, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I, I think it's not just bats that we have this issue with, although it's obviously really important that we understand it now because of, of everything that's going on. I have colleagues who work on bumblebees and until quite recently, there's been much more coverage of bumblebees in the last 10 years, but he was always fairly despondent that people thought there was one species of bumblebee. And I think that's the same when people don't know much about groups mm -hmm. of organisms, they think there's one of them. So, so partly it's about um, education as just how cool um, science is and natural history is. And also the different, I, I am the last person in the world to think that you should justify the conservation of a species because of what it can do for humans. But I think this is a really important message in this particular case. It's about what do these bats do for us? And obviously that varies massively according to what they feed on and where they live and whether or not we have people go into caves and mine guano so there's all sorts of services that bats provide to humans some of which are really critical for local communities um, but they're tied to one or a few species so it's i guess it's bundling those kind of messages up in our in our education this is a, a nice question for the for the whole panel um, Maybe Kirsty, if you if you want to start, but is it what is uh, one thing you wish the general public knew about COVID nineteen that is not widespread knowledge? <laughs> uh, oh, that's not widespread knowledge. I don't. I, I I've been reading uh, papers recently on trying to predict 
zoonotic disease spillovers. And one I saw really recently was, I mean, it's all correlational, it's not an experiment, uh, but I was really intrigued to see that they, they looked at threatened species status, uh, and this is um, as uh, classified by the IUCN. They looked at the reasons those species were threatened, and then they looked at uh, zoonotic disease databases to see which species. And there are, there are limitations and biases with these sorts of analyses, but nevertheless, they found that uh, threatened species which had population reductions which were specifically tied to loss of habitat and reductions in habitat quality um, were predicted to have um, twice as many zoonotic diseases as threatened species which were threatened for other reasons. So I think getting over that kind of information, what are the drivers of zoonotic diseases? What can we practically do um, environmentally uh, that's going to reduce that without going down the very misguided route of just trying to kill animals out of it. Thank you. And Ricardo, do you have anything to add? Anything you'd like people to know about COVID-19 that's not widespread? Well, it's not specifically about COVID-19, but it's about zoonoses in general and some zoonoses that relate to that. So up until now, um, Regarding rabies, for instance, there's a very interesting study from Peru that shows that culling bats or trying to cull bats or disturbing colonies actually increases uh, the probability of spillover. So increases the, the amount of viruses relating in the, in, the, in, the, in the bat populations and so on. These are vampire bats uh, that are specific for the neotropics. I need to, to emphasize this. Uh, but so being worried about this backfiring effect of disturbing the colonies of trying to call animals. Uh, that I, I don't think that is very well known, but there's quite a lot of evidence of different zoonoses in which this, this happens. So anything that relates with going into caves, disturbing bats, uh, with the intent of uh, reducing the risk might actually contribute by increasing the risk. So that's uh, an important point to put across. I don't know if you have anything to add before we have a, a question for you after this. Yeah, so I'll be looking at the question, so what are the ways of combating misconceptions? Um, it's very difficult to do that in the middle of a crisis situation because people read lots of information, you know, people are scared. So it, it's really about, I think, long-term education programs so that we're not in a situation where if there's an outbreak, we're just trying to do um, damage control. We, we need to establish in communities, we need to establish uh, education baseline before something like this happens. And that's why it's so important to have these multidisciplinary research programs where we're not just going out testing the bats, we're understanding human behavior, we couple that with, with education on the species as well as um, prevention of diseases and then I think we will have much better success should something like this happen and we try and then mitigate that in the media. Thank you. And then I've got a question from Keith. He asks, is the illegal wildlife trade of exotics increasing the risk of the transfer of zoonotic diseases from animals to humans? It's a difficult question. Um, there's definitely some aspect of it in illegal wildlife trade, but it's all about contact. So if there's a lot of contact with wild animals that's not illegal, it's also a risk. It's just in the illegal trade, it's, it's sometimes more difficult to pick it up because you're not going to get the information. Um, so you might get it, uh, detect an outbreak or a spillover earlier if it's not illegal. but um, both both trades are going to give you contact with animals. And if I can comment about this, one of, one of the dangers for me is uh, being one-sided when it comes to this dialogue and focusing only on legal or illegal wildlife trade is that it actually takes attention from other problems that might be the source of this or other outbreaks. So, it, and, and it's, it's a problem that while it's a, it's a big one and we should think about it, it's somewhat disconnected for most of the citizens. 
and it kind of externalizes the, the burden of actually doing something or looking at other drivers that are closest to us, either urbanization or uh, habitat destruction uh, due to agriculture or what, what it might be, or like having pets around going to, uh, and, and hunting animals. So I think that that's also an issue like of us focusing on problems that are a bit removed from our day-to-day -day lives, just not to face so much uh, attention to things that we can share. Thank you. And then our next question is from Rob, and he was asking, are there characteristics of uh, rhinolophid bat physiology that make them good hosts for COVID, or is the prevalence of COVID with these bats a product of their range? It's a difficult one because I don't think we know. We, we, that's one of the things that's only been starting, um, there's more research in the last few years, really looking at bat characteristics, how their immune responses work. And one thing that is clear from the very limited work that has been done, it seems like even on a species level, you can get differences. And not on gene general level, there's obviously differences also. So yes, there must be some reason why rhinolophid bats are associated with SARS coronaviruses, but I don't think we know. And it, it seems to be, relatively widespread and um, the diversity is different but for instance we also find on the African content, continent SARS like viruses um, that's linked to SARS coronavirus 1 the 2002 outbreak we have ones that's related that we've identified in Kenya and in Rwanda so it's not just in China it, it seems to be more widespread Um, and then I've got a question, another question from Keith, and this one is uh, for Ricardo. And he's asking, um, do you have examples from your work about effective ways to engage communities in minimizing the risk um, of the spread of zoonotic diseases? Well, I don't I don't have examples exactly from my work per se, because I don't I don't work necessarily on this in this area. Uh, there's some um, there's some literature on the use of this protection from for for palms, I, and I think that this relates with uh, with Nipah virus, uh, but I'm I'm not sure. So this is this uh, protective structure that is put on palm trees to prevent bats to access these containers that are, that are being used to collect the to collect the swap of the of the palm trees and to prevent bats to access these structures. So there's some evidence-based solutions to um, addressing zoonotic spillover. But this, so my understanding of this is that we, we, we need much more research uh, in, in, in evidence-based interventions that might limit uh, the spillover either from bats into humans or other wildlife into, into humans. But there's, there's, there's some uh, uh, evidence already out there for some zoonoses in some particular context. If I can maybe just add to that, I, I couldn't agree with that more. So like I showed in my last slide, we will always have diversity of these viruses and wildlife. We will find more and more and more the more we look. But it's about changing human behavior that is becoming more important. But then we also need to understand what that human behavior is. And I don't think we're at that point. A lot of our studies are missing that. We don't understand the interaction of humans with bats because it's very region specific. It's very cultural specific. Uh, there's so many things that can be different in different areas, but we need to understand that and target that with our education and our communication programs. Thank you. And if I can add something very quickly to my, to my, to my question. So there's a really interesting uh, paper that I think it was published in 2012 in proceedings of the Royal Society D that speaks about ecological I wanted to to get the title the title right but it's ecological interventions how key, how can we can get win-win solutions in terms of disease transmission and we know that one of the big drivers of uh, uh, disease spillover appears to be habitat loss and habitat modification and degradation and hence, we can work our way the other in, into the, the other direction. 
if we engage in habitat restoration and limit habitat destruction and so on, where like the, the likelihood is that we're limiting uh, potential spillover spillover uh, events. And this is a paper from 2012 in uh, Proceedings of the Royal Society B, if I remember correctly. But I, I, I can I can share the link later. Thank you very much, Ricardo. So just to let you know, um, we're, we'll be recording this and putting it on YouTube and, and any of these papers that um, our panel recommend, we'll, we'll put the links on there. Our next question is from Quincy, um, and maybe Kirsty could um, start with this one, is um, what are the key ways of combating the misconceptions of bats and coronavirus um, generated by major outlets such as CNN? <laughs> um, well, as Vanda said earlier, I think it's hard to do in the middle of a, of, of a pandemic. Um, but uh, a number of people have pointed out that it's really important to challenge to not just read it, get annoyed, and then put it down and not do anything about it. So challenge the journalist that wrote it, tweet about it. Um, Ricardo is, a, is an expert um, in this in, in the last few months. Um, and challenge those uh, misconceptions and give them the correct facts. It's not as simple as that. Um, but, uh, and there's loads of really useful information in the paper in biological conservation that Ricardo mentioned um, earlier in terms of the, the phrasing that you use to try and give that more impact and telling people um, how important bats are to us. So there have been a number of terrible headlines and it's not just CNN, the Washington Post, there was a newspaper in Australia and the headline, um, I think partly Maybe partly because bats sometimes get pretty bad PR anyway. So a sloppy journalist thinks, oh, this is great. I'll just come up with a snappy headline for that. Um, and it reinforces, if people do have negative views, it, it reinforces those. Um, so, I mean, I have to say that a lot of the people that I come into contact with, this might be a slightly biased sample, actually their views of bats are, this isn't through, um, bat conservation trust organizations, I should say, members of the public and students. Um, when I tell them I, I work on bats, their main um, uh, uh, is enthusiasm. Their main response is enthusiasm and interest. So I think telling people, giving them information about how cool bats are um, and how important they are to us and challenging sloppy journalism and bad headlines either through writing directly or through social media um, is more useful than just getting annoyed about it in silence. Mm -hmm. So if I, if I can comment uh, about this, so one of the reasons why, why we wrote that paper, it, it, it related with familiarity. And the fact that now we, need, we, we have been feeling this urge to action. So there's a lot of people that, well, that are thirsty for information about this disease and about the links between bats and this disease. And we, the, the, the bat conservationists and the bat biologists, have been picked up by the media quite often to speak about this. Uh, and many, many times, the, we try to put our information across the best as we can, but there's a layer of um, power that we don't, we don't have. At the end of the day, we don't manage the headlines and that is to be journalists. And I think that it's true that we should, um, that we should go after the truth and uh, persecute the journals, or not persecute, that's, that's a bad word. Uh, we, 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 try to, we should try to engage in a dialogue on the fact that news should be accurate and should try not to vilify the bats if they have no, no blame for it. But also, we, we, we need to be worried about our community as bat biologists, that we should not be uh, engaging in this sort of uh, shaming, like online. It's not exactly our viewpoint. And also, I think that we need to be very careful with our viewpoint and have uh, the idea that science is changing. And we need to be very careful how we say things like we cannot like uh, certainty can backfire. And if we say that we are absolutely sure that bats have nothing uh, to do with this, like this can be weaponized in, in, in the future. I'm not saying that bats are associated with it or not, 
but just saying that we sh we, sh we need to be very 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 careful with our uh, with our phrasing, and that can be seen by others in the community that see the, the issue from a from a different viewpoint, and uh, to to engage in this uh, not so nice interaction in which you're putting your uh, ideas across, but by doing so, you're publicly shaming others in a way that is not very helpful for the community at, uh, at large. And, so, yeah. uh, and just, just very quickly, the paper that I was mentioning is called Ecological Intervention to Prevent the Management of Zoonotic Pathogen Spillover and was published last year, not in 2012. I'm sorry. Thank you. And also, I suppose it's also important to, to kind of reiterate what Vanda was saying is, you know, sometimes also when scientists are, are interviewed, they could be taken out of context. So you know, it's also to be careful that you're not going and, and attacking somebody when actually they probably didn't say, you know, they might not have said what has been published. And I know um, Kirsty has been involved in quite a lot of communicating science and, and working with, um, uh, you know, journalists, um, certainly in, in the UK. And, and, you know, that is an issue sometimes, um, you know, things are misinterpreted. Um, and yeah, is oh. sorry, just to say, I, I, I guess I'd like to think that most journalists aren't doing this. Um, they're not deliberately trying to, to, to mislead people, but they are. They might be after a snappy headline, which is misleading, but it sounds better to them. So it, you know, it's. I, I agree absolutely. We shouldn't be. We shouldn't be on the attack, but we should be correcting um, wherever yeah, we can. I agree. Definitely. And Christy is going to have to um, shoot off. Um, she's got another meeting. Oh, so I just wanted to take a very quick uh, thank you very, very much. I, I do have one. I'm sorry, I've noticed a question that someone's asked about whether or not pangolins and COVID-19 <laughs> could be an additional threat to pangolins. And I think Vonda will do a, a better uh, answer to me in terms of the disease. But one thing that I've noticed, and this is a bit anecdotal, but at least in terms of how humans are responding to pangolins, actually, this could be great for pangolins because there are, there are plans or they've already been put in place, I think, to ban the trade in pangolins. They're one of the most trafficked uh, group of species um, in the world. So, and they're greatly under threat by overexploitation and wildlife markets. So if that results in a in reducing or stopping that trade, then, then th this could be great. Uh, for pangolins. It's unfortunate that um, bats are being seen in uh, a quite different light, I think, from mm -hmm. other species. Thank you very much. And um, I've got a, another question. So I don't know if, if you're, are you shooting off, um, Kirsty? So, um, yes, I am. Sorry, I need to go. This has been fascinating. Thanks, yeah. everyone. Right, for thanks, Thank, you. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thanks very much. So, to let you know um, that we'll respect everybody who, who needs to shoot off now, so feel free to, to do that if you need to go. Um, but Vanda and Ricardo very kindly um, offered to stay on a little bit longer because we knew there'd be lots and lots of questions. Um, and anything we don't get through now, um, we'll be putting together some question and answers um, that we'll send around um, in a Word document for you to read afterwards. Um, our next question is from Hanani, and he was saying, many times uh, bats do not usually manifest symptoms of the diseases that they carry. But, um, taking this into account, the similarities of the viruses with the pangolin coronaviruses, do you think that COVID-19 could be an additional threat to pangolins or other species in the wild? So I think the short answer to that is we don't know. Um, I think it, the only advantage is what um, Christy mentioned, that the publicity around the fact that they identified a similar virus in pangolins has actually been good for the illegal trade of pangolins, I think, in a way. Um, but I don't think we know at this point. This is People are busy writing grants and trying to study this only now. So we don't really know what the disease potential is going to be in any other wildlife or even domestic species at this specific point. Um, and this next one is uh, from Behirathan, and he was saying, what are the odds of direct transmission of any zoonotic viruses from a bat to a human in an urbanized setup? I ask this because there is more fear among the urban public leading to destroying roosts and killing bats 
that are coexisting with people in cities. A follow-up question would be that are there any risks um, that wouldn't, you know, from follow-up question would be that if there are any risks um, from killing would that killing bats would um, increase that risk more. Yeah, so I think on the first part of the question, I mean, this is typically we get in South Africa lots of calls where people have bats in their houses and they just want to get them out and that's all they care about. And I think it's a bit different depending on what zoonotic virus you're talking about. So if you're talking about rabies, there needs to be direct contact. The bat actually needs to scratch or bite you. So if the bat is in a roof that they can only exit to the outside, there's, there's not really a risk. If you've got a lot of bats in your house and there's a lot of fecal and urine contamination dripping down your walls where you're eating in your kitchen, then, then there's a risk because you're getting into contact with urine and fecal that may have coronaviruses or some other so potential zoonotic viruses. So that's not a healthy situation. But it, it depends, I think, on the specific contact that you're going to have either with bad excretions or with um, the bat itself. And it's been shown, it's actually, there's only one good paper out, and that was a paper published by CDC, where um, they killed uh, a whole colony of Rosetta's bats was, was completely destroyed um, after they thought that these bats will, will transmit Marburg virus. And when the CDC went back and they retested the colony, the place where they um, eliminated the colony got repopulated by the bats um, from probably nearby areas. And there was more virus circulating in that colony after they exterminated the colony than before. So that, that's not an option. I mean, if you empty a space at, and the bats have the opportunity to come back or other bats can come back into that space, they will, and you would probably stress them and there will just be more disease opportunities um, when they come back. If I, if I can add to this, uh, so I think that, so in the paper that we just published, we speak about this um, uh, negative correlation between risks and, and benefits. And we can speak about uh, disease spillover risks, but the, we know that many bats provide benefits to humans. And we need to speak about those benefits as well that if we if by any reason we we go after the bats that are in a human uh, more urbanized setting we're decreasing uh, the benefits or we're impacting the benefits that we are getting from the bats and we don't know which which well we know some of these benefits we don't know the magnitude of all of all of these benefits and uh, so i think that when engaging in a conversation about about this particular issue about bats in uh, humanized settings. We need to speak, of course, about the, the disease risks uh, or the disease risks, but we need to speak about all this, this benefit. So that would be one, one perspective. And then the other one would be uh, context or to, so uh, Vanda just mentioned rabies from, from bats and that's, that's, that's a risk that's a, uh, well, the, the biggest zoonotic disease that we tend to associate with bats, I would say. But actually, when we take into consideration that uh, more than 90%, I think it's 99% of the cases of rabies in humans uh, are related with uh, dog bites. So that, that's data that comes from the World Health Organization in 2013. It kind of shows that we're speaking about rabies and bats a lot, but actually, like we should be speaking about rabies and, and dogs. So when we get a bit, a bit more of context, we see the risks uh, more often. Because now when we speak about, about bats, it's, so the bats have a set of traits that make them uh, news prone. So they're, it's very easy to vi uh, vi vilify bats and to uh, have fancy headlines with, with bats and zoonotic disease. And that's, that increases the risk of fear. And we engage in these discussions, we need to have into account that this disease risk sometimes is inflated just to this negative, pre-existing negative association 
that we tend to have with, with bats. Yeah, actually, that's a really good point. And I think actually, you know, environmental education and en engaging um, young people uh, is sort of about the importance of bats. It's actually really important in changing attitudes. There was certainly you know, a difference of opinion kind of when it was, you know, bats were being blamed to then when pangolins were being blamed. And I think it's because of, you know, um, bats have such a, and as a few people have mentioned in the comments, uh, have got a very negative, um, negative view. And certainly in Malawi, and, and Helen will say this also in Zambia, have got cases of people actually chopping down trees especially for eidolon the straw colored fruit bat um, and given we have such issues with um, deforestation you know the, the, the areas that the bats have left are smaller and smaller and smaller and then chopping down those trees or you know sometimes kids take catapults to them and try and you know kind of move them off and um, so it, i think it's a it's a, certainly an issue for us as well um, it sounds like it's an issue in asia but certainly an issue for us in in africa and um mm. Rina has a question um, probably for Vanda. Um, what kind of interaction supposedly occurred between the bat and pangolin? So I really don't know. So the pangolins have tested positive were not even indigenous pangolins and they were not close to that market. So um, I think there's a big question mark if there was a link between the bats and the pangolins or if the pangolins just got the disease from somewhere else. Um, it, it, I don't think we know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so then um, Mohammed was just saying, uh, relating to, to the question you've just answered, uh, the previous question about um, you know, bats um, being, uh, people being more scared of bats in an urban environment has said I think it's um, fear for those who um, wrongly feed um, sort of the hate of bats um, and if you otherwise don't interact with humans in urban dwellings. Um, and then Melissa's also pointed out um, Merlin Tuttle has a specific um, bat flash um, regarding CNN um, kind of bat special so she's put the link there. Um, so the Merlin Tuttle, um, Merlin Tuttle's bat uh, conservation organization does have um, a number of um, uh, bat flashes that they, they do try and um, kind of rectify and, and call out incorrect information. So for anybody interested, please do check out their website. Um, and then uh, Bruce Patterson has just said, um, this has been a really wonderful program of which he's learned a lot. Thanks very much to Vanda, Kirsty and Ricardo and everyone who has asked questions. Um, and then there's, uh, it's just, I think that it's mostly, it's just thanking the panel um, very much for, for all of the work. So I don't know if um, there's maybe a few more minutes if anybody has a last few questions, but I don't know if there's anything else um, that Vanda and Ricardo, I know you have so much information and knowledge if you would like to add anything else. So maybe just from my side, the point that I wanted to make also with the short presentation is we cannot ignore that we're detecting some of these related viruses in bats. Um, and I, I think we spend too much time trying to debate that and trying to sort of make that disappear, that we're not concentrating on the important things, which is wildlife human interactions, which is gotten a much wider impact if we all focus on that message <laughs> rather than, than trying to say, but this virus is not important or this virus is important or bats is not the only ones having viruses. That is not gonna help any of us um, to really go forward and get the message to the public and really prevent spillover. So, and, and actually, um, I will just speak about uh, I would use the, 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 well, one of the things that Vanda just mentioned, that speaking about wildlife in general. So one of the things has, that has been worrying me quite a bit is that uh, conservation biologists that not necessarily work with bats have been weaponizing this pandemic to speak about um, habitat destruction and so on that are all valid points that we should all be speaking about. But sometimes in the process, they do use bats and they vilify bats uh, without being uh, aware that they are doing so. And that has a big, uh, a big consequence for, for bat conservation down, down the line. So I guess that bat conservationists have been speaking about this quite, quite a lot. 
but other conservationists have been a bit less uh, attentive when it when it comes when it comes to to this. And I think that also in in, in the midst of this uh, all, of all the craziness related with this with this pandemic, uh, more than speaking about um, or trying trying to blame a given a given taxa. Uh, the, one of the things that we can do as bat conservationists is to to speak about bats and the benefits and putting across positive messages about about bats, but without vilifying the work of others and without undermining the scientific evidence that relates with zoonotic zoonotic disease risk, not closing the eyes for mistruths that might be circulating but being very worried that we cannot call mistruths to things that are not mistruths per se. So one needs to be very careful with that. No, that that's a really good point, actually. And um, so Lisa from Bat Conservation Trust has said, thank you very much for a really interesting presentation and discussion. Sadly, she has to dash off, but she's looking forward to watching this again on YouTube. Um, and then Kat has said, thanks for a fascinating chat, guys. Um, a lot of this boils down to the importance of understanding human-wildlife interactions and improving um, the human relations um, we have with the natural world, as well as the importance of communicating. And um, I mean, one of the issues I've certainly heard that there has been, you know, across Africa, certainly rampant um, sort of persecution of bats. And also, it, there are no. Is that there's an increase also with the you know bats being killed illegally and um, through kind of poisoning and pesticide use, um, certainly in homes. And this, we we've heard reports of a you know increase in the pest control industry going in and terminating bats. And as far as we're aware, there's actually no pesticide that's been is legalized anywhere in the world to kill bats. So it's actually it is illegal. And and I just wondered if you had any insights into how best to and, and certainly we've seen this actually, I saw an advert in, um, in uh, North America as well, where they were saying, you know, now's the time to get rid of your bats, give us a call. So people are also cashing in on the fear factor. Um, and I just wondered how, um, if you had any insights into how people could go about tackling, you know, that kind of, of issue. So my, my first goal would be uh, sorry I don't know then if you want to go but my my first goal would be if it's if it's actually illegal just report it to the authorities as soon as soon as possible and and again to try to emphasize the the, the benefits associated with that that we are being one sided and trying to shed a bit of truth in the whole dynamics of the things we just, we already emphasized the fact that there's four hundred uh, fourteen hundred different, more than 1,400 uh, different types of, of, or different species of bats. Bats are not this one unit, like we, we need more nuance in this, in this discussion. And if there's, pe if there's people trying to cash in in, in, in this, we, yeah, we need to report them, we need to bring visibility to the issue. Uh, but again, uh, without, without vilifying bats because familiarity. So if, if we see that someone is, let's say, selling um, a, a specific poison to target bats due to their association with diseases, if we are very vocal about this openly, we might reinforce the association between bats and disease, and at the same time use our platform to bring visibility to these people that want, want the word out about their product. So we need to be very careful in, in how we engage this conversation so that it uh, does not backfire. So maybe from my side and our experience in South Africa, I used to be with a bat interest group for quite a few years. And we used to get a lot of calls where people just want to get rid of bats. That's all that call does about. And we used to do these bat walks and we would then invite them to the bat walk, show them the bats, and in the end, they just wanted the bats in their room forever. So it's, it's all about engaging with people, explaining things to them that they weren't aware of. Most people are not aware of um, the interesting facts around bats. It's just something that lives in their roof and flying around at night um, that they, know, they don't know anything about. So as soon as you have that engagement, even in a negative situation, even if somebody wants to poison the bats, 
you must go there, you must try and talk to them. And a lot of, a lot of times, um, in my experience, you will actually change their minds by having that one-to-one um, -one interaction and not judging them at that point for trying to kill the bats, but trying to explain to them why they shouldn't do it and how wonderful they are. Yeah, that, that's a it's a really good point and it's trying to kind of go and and actually talk to them i mean certainly we we do a lot of that um where actually people change their attitudes very quickly they just have that you know bit of one-to-one -one help or even an opportunity like we had somebody here who was terrified of us and she came along to a bat walk and now she's actually one of the biggest advocates um here in blantyre for, for bats which is which is really brilliant mm. um, and also for for those uh people i just wanted to also highlight that like certainly with the straw colored fruit bat is one of um, the few bats that are protected under the convention of migratory species in most countries across africa um, and there's also something that i would i would suggest if you're trying to engage your decision makers and um, we've certainly had issues where you know even councils are cutting down trees with idle on roosts or um, we've had cases where um, in rwanda where the kind of the police have gone in uh, with the fire brigade and and actually you know, use the big fire water cannons to to kind of um, move the bats off which actually under the convention is is not allowed so i think it's also worth people pointing out and using kind of you know international treaties that are in place and also you know national kind of um, strategy you know the national biodiversity and strategy action plan targets try and get them on board but um certainly we have struggled with quite a few um kind of government authorities and getting them interested in um, and I just wondered if either of you have any insights into, I mean, again, you know, maybe inviting them on bat walks to come and see work you do is a great way. Often, as soon as you say bats, um, they kind of shut down. And I know a lot of my colleagues across Africa have had the same issue. I think it, it for me, it always goes back to long-term relationships. Um, it's not something I can't now phone up the Department of Health and ask them to attend my bat walk tomorrow and they're going to be excited about it. Um, it's, it's really about relationships that you build with people, exposing them to the work, exposing them little by little to how important it is and how interesting it is. And then in the end, you get people who participate. Um, but it's, it's not a quick just invite and you think everybody's going to pitch up and they're going to think bats are going to be the most important thing. It's it's really long-term relationships. And, and again, going back to the benefits associated with bats. So uh, the straw-colored bats are one of the bats that we speak specifically in our publication in Biological Conservation. And what we say is based on a paper that was published in 2016 that shows that this particular bat species is capable, capable to disperse seeds up to four times the distance, uh, the known distance dispersed by similar sized frugivores. And it shows how important this, this species, and I would say related species, are in terms of seed dispersal that relate with deforestation, that relate with climate change, that relate with uh, hydrological circle, uh, circle, uh, well, uh, hydrology of the forest, habitat to other species, and so on. Like we, we do need a bigger picture here, and not not taking into account all these different dynamics, it's uh, it's it's very dangerous for for us. Yeah. Thank you. And um, Lily is just saying that uh, the Bat Conservation Trust um, has had some really good successes with species champions in the Scottish Parliament, and individual members of Parliament to adopt a bat species um, to be a champion. And I remember um, there was a Anne Youngman used to be the Scottish bat officer, and she actually sent um, at the time um, there was only one Scottish MSP, and they decided to drop a bat for a toad, which is also really. You know, the toads needed, needed fans too. Um, but, so, uh, Anne Youngman is, is incredibly uh, you know, uh, creative in, in her way. So what she does, she actually sent all the MSPs Valentine's Day cards from bats. And in the end, I think she got like five or seven uh, different um, Scottish species um, champions, which was actually quite a, a nice way. And then, of course, then, you know, that, that conversation starts. I guess it's trying to be creative and getting your foot in the door. <laughs> So, um, and then we have uh, another question from Lance, who 
and says, um, what does the future hold surrounding COVID viruses for both humans and animals? <laughs> So, so it's a difficult one. Unfortunately, if we look at the past, every 10 years or so, we had a, a coronavirus human outbreak um, that's been linked in some way to an animal source. Um, first, it was SARS coronavirus 1, then MERS, and now SARS coronavirus 2. And with the diversity, I think, circulating in wildlife, if we don't do something about the opportunities for spillover, and this has got to do with the contact between humans and other animals with some of the wildlife species that harbor this diversity, we, we are unfortunately gonna see more outbreaks. So that is really the interface that we need to concentrate on. We can't be in this situation again in 10 years, looking back at exactly the same information than we did for COVID-19 and say, oh, we should have looked at human behavior, behavior. we should have changed, um, things like how we mixed animals in, in markets, all those things, and then we say, and it happened again. So I think it's all on the researchers on how we're gonna target future work and really answer the important questions that needs to be answered to prevent spillover. Thank you. And then um, just our last comment from Rena was saying that the general public also needs to understand that bats are critically important, not only for ecology, also for biomedical research. Um, so um, yes, we should just had uh, that comment. Um, and then we've now come to the end of our questions. So I just wanted to say a huge thank you, Vanda, Ricardo, and also to Kirsty. And unfortunately, Paul Wabala's had to have a knee operation and um, he's busy recovering, but he was really upset to not have been here. Um, but thank you very much. And we will be um, putting the recording onto YouTube and I'll send you all the links. Um, but just before we go, I don't know if uh, Vanda and Ricardo have any uh, last comments that you wanted to say. Well, on my on my end, just a big thank you. Uh, I've learned I've I've learned a lot, uh, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity of sharing this time with you all. And that's basically it. No, nothing else from my end. Thank you. Thank you um, for organizing it, and thank you for all the interesting questions there were some questions that made me think also. So it's always nice to see what, what is um, the things that people want to ask questions about and the important things that we also need to think of from a biology perspective. So thank you. I know that's true. And actually, and you know, going back to the sort of interdisciplinary, I mean, it's fantastic, you know, seeing you know, conservation biologists, we've got, you know, kind of uh, environmental educationists, you know, expert virologists. So it's actually really great to see, you know, people coming together, to try and, um, you know, learn more from each other and, and tackle this problem. So we really appreciate your time. I know now is a crazy time for, for all of you, um, being super busy. And so thank you very, very much uh, to the panel for taking the time to help us with um, this uh, webinar. Pleasure. Thank you, Rachel. Okay, then. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.